Good evening. It's good to be with you again. I think it's uh, several months since, since Heather and I were here, but uh, it's always good to come and to share fellowship with you and uh, to read God's word and to think carefully about all that God has to say to us. And so we're going to start our service with a reading from 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 29. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. In the first month of the first year of his reign, he opened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. He brought in the priests and the Levites, assembled them in the square on the east side and said, listen to me, Levites, consecrate yourself now and consecrate the temple of the Lord, the God of your ancestors. Remove all defilement from the sanctuary our parents were unfaithful. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord, our God, and forsook him. They turned their faces away from the Lord's dwelling place and turned their backs on him. They also shut the doors of the portico and put out the lamps. They did not burn incense or present any burnt offerings at the sanctuary to the, Lord, to the God of Israel. Therefore, the anger of the Lord has fallen on Judah and Jerusalem. He has made them an object of dread and horror and scorn, as you can see with your own eyes. This is why our fathers have fallen by the sword and why our sons and daughters and our wives are in captivity. Now I intend to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that his fierce anger will turn away from us. My sons, do not be negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him and serve him to minister before him and to burn incense. Tonight we're going to be thinking about the life of Hezekiah. But I just want to make, uh, rather than sort of expand on that passage itself, because we'll be doing that later, I just wanted to highlight that this is one of those prayers. You'll find it also in places like Daniel and Nehemiah, where the leader of the people confesses before God the sins of the nation. And we recognise that we live in, a, in times where our nation too has sinned against the law of God, against God himself. He is not held in the honour that he should be. And so we recognise that we too share in that, that trouble that comes upon the land when God's name is not honoured. And so we, we, we do come and we plead before God that he will be merciful in our day. It's good to hear. Well, yesterday, Heather and I were up in London for the Grace Baptist Mission uh, annual meeting, and we were listening to different presentations. Uh, it is good to hear that around the world, there are hundreds and thousands of people turning to the Lord. They have heard the gospel. We heard of one radio station that was served by uh, Grace Baptist Mission. They received the the, the radio programs on CD or uh, a little disc or something, and they've broadcast these in, uh, in the Congo. And you'll know that there are parts of the Congo which suffer Islamic terrorism and all sorts of other troubles, and people had no church to go to. So they were going to the radio station looking for help, looking for answers to the questions that they had, having heard the gospel over the radio. So it's good to hear, it's good to remind ourselves that God is still at work and we pray that he will be merciful to our nation too 
and that he will turn people back to himself. As I said, we're going to be looking at the life of Hezekiah uh, today. So we've got two, two other readings on the life of Hezekiah, and Heather's going to come and bring the first of those to us now. 2 Kings chapter 18, beginning at verse 17. The king of Assyria sent his supreme commander, his chief officer and his field commander with a large army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. They came up to Jerusalem and stopped at the aqueducts of the upper pool on the road to the washman's field. They called for the king and Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the recorder, went out to them. The field commander said to them, Tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria, says. And what are you basing this confidence of yours? You say you have the counsel and the might for war, but you speak only empty words. On whom are you depending that you rebel against me? Look, I know you are depending on Egypt, that splintered reed of a staff which pierces the hand of anyone who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on him. But if you say to me, we are depending on the Lord our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Come now, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can put riders on them. How can you repulse one officer of the least of my master's officials, even though you are depending on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Furthermore, have I come to attack and destroy this place without word from the Lord? The Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, and Shebna and Joah said to the field commander, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, since we understand it. Don't speak to us in Hebrew, in the hearing of the people on the wall. But the commander replied, Was it only to your master and you that my master sent me to say these things, and not to the people sitting on the wall, who, like you, will have to eat their own excrement and drink their own urine? Then the commander stood and called out in Hebrew, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king of says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you from my hand. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then each of you will eat fruit from your own vine and fig tree and drink water from your own cistern until I come and take you to a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey. Choose life, not death. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for he is misleading you when he says, The Lord will deliver us. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hena and Ivar? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who of all the gods of these countries have been able to save his land from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? But the people remained silent and said nothing in reply. 
because the king had commanded, do not answer him. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the recorder, went to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him what the field commander had said. When King Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and went in to the temple of the Lord. He sent Eliakim, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and the leading priests, all wearing sackcloth, to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. They told him, this is what Hezekiah says, this day is a day of distress and rebuke and disgrace, as when children come to the moment of birth and there is no strength to deliver them. It may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words of the field commander, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to ridicule the living God, and that he will rebuke him for the words the Lord your God has heard. Therefore pray for the remnant that still survives. When King Hezekiah's officials came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Tell your master, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid of what you have heard, those words with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen, when he hears a certain report, I will make him want to return to his own country, and there I will have him cut down with the sword. Ted's now going to come and bring us another reading, a very short reading, from Isaiah chapter 38. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order, because you are going to die. You will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. Go and tell Hezekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David, says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city. This is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he has promised. I will make the shadow cast by the sun go back the ten steps it has gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. So the sunlight went back the ten steps it had gone down. The people of Israel rejected Samuel's sons as potential judges to rule over them, and rightly so. They were basically dishonest men. But Israel then asked Samuel to appoint a king so that they could be like other nations. What they were actually doing was rejecting God as their king. It was part of their drift away from God. Saul was appointed to meet the sort of person that the Israelites wanted. But after initially starting well, Saul also turned away from God and became a paranoid despot who murdered God's priests and sought to kill the man appointed by God as his replacement as well as seeking to kill his own son. Saul's replacement was God's choice and is described as a man after God's own heart in 1 Samuel 13, verse 14. Although David was Israelite's greatest king and sought to serve God well, he was also a man like us 
and fell into sin. Indeed, his sins were serious, committing murder and adultery. David repented and was restored. His son Solomon also fell into serious sin, giving in to idol worship, having many, married many pagan wives. And so the slide began. King followed king. Some were better than others, but none were perfect. The Bible is honest about the nature of these men. Today we're going to look at one of the best, but still a flawed man. Hezekiah is one of those that we know most about after Saul and David and Solomon. His story is told to us in two kings, two chronicles, and in Isaiah. Four key stories feature in the Bible. The restoration of the temple, the restoration of the Passover, his actions when faced by an invasion, and his illness and restoration. We will take a brief look at his life and see what lessons we can draw as we go along. So first, Hezekiah becomes king. Hezekiah's grandfather was Jotham. He had become regent when his own father, Uzziah, was punished with leprosy by God for becoming proud and arrogant and breaking God's command. Jotham was personally faithful to God, but did little to drive corruption out of the nation. Militarily, he was successful, but he died when he was only 41. His son Ahaz was a complete contrast. He was an evil man, even making sacrifices of some of his own children to pagan gods. He suffered a number of military defeats and sought help from the Assyrians, but they too attacked him. He robbed God's temple and had it closed up. He died at an even younger age of 36. So it is interesting that when Hezekiah became king, he did not follow his father, but instead became an even more zealous servant of God than his grandfather and great-grandfather. So we are left to wonder how the different influences on his life shaped him. He would have been a boy of only about nine years old when his grandfather died. But was it his grandfather who shaped his life? Yet his zeal for God exceeded that of Jotham. At the very start of his reign, Hezekiah orders the temple to be reopened again. He is not a remote uh, monarch. No, he gets directly involved in the management of the restoration of the temple. And he clearly understood the spiritual aspects of the trouble that they, they were in. In 2 Chronicles 29, verses 6 to 9, he identifies the unfaithfulness of the previous generations as the cause of their nation's troubles. But in verse 10, Hezekiah pledges a new covenant with God to turn away the Lord's anger. And in verse 11, he reminds the priests and the Levites of the position of responsibility and privilege they had been given. And so he urges them on to faithful service. It was David and Solomon who had arranged the allocation of duties for the Levites and set them to work in the temple. Now, a new secular ruler revives this work regime. It is thus interesting to see the way secular rulers can have a leading role in shaping the spiritual welfare of a nation. We can think back to World War II, where it was George VI who called for days of prayer at crisis points in the war. We should therefore note the way our nation has been led 
in recent years. Although politicians may stand up and read scriptures in national uh, religious services, we do not see any great commitment to God. As a result, some of the laws passed in recent times have been opposed to the teaching of scripture. How we as a nation need strong Christian leadership in Parliament once more. The Levites were set to work to clear and purify the temple. From the entry doors, it takes them eight days to get through to the temple itself. Any abandoned place will quickly be taken over by nature, so you can probably imagine the way the weeds and perhaps even trees have grown up over the years. Or the rubbish is taken out to the Kidron Valley, which was in part the city's rubbish dump but it was also the place where the pagan gods were worshipped. It then takes another eight days to clear the temple itself. Finally, all is cleaned and made ready. But ready for what? Ready for reconsecration. The physical cleaning has taken place. Now it is necessary to rededicate the, place, the space to the living God. Sacrifices were needed. But see how Hezekiah now gathers the leaders of the city to take part in the ceremonies. These men represent the people. They lay their hands on the sin offerings. This represents the transfer of the sins of the people to the animals which are then killed to acknowledge the penalty of sin. In a similar way, those who arrested Jesus when those who mocked him, those who crucified him, laid hands on him. And so Jesus died for the sins of mankind. He was our substitute. Sin must be atoned for. We cannot break God's law and simply shrug our shoulders and walk away expecting God to forgive us. No, here Hezekiah is making sin sacrifices to seek God's forgiveness. In the same way, we need to acknowledge our sins and the sins of our nation and Jesus' sacrifice if we are to receive his forgiveness. But there follows a period of worship and thanksgiving. This acknowledged the promised mercy of God towards his people. The worship of God had been restored and the people rejoiced. Under the sort of despotic rule of a king like Ahaz, Hezekiah's father, challenge of authoritarian rule would have probably resulted in death. But it seems that the people, at least a good proportion of the people, really wanted to worship God. What they had done in the meantime, we don't know. Perhaps like millions across the world, they had to worship in secret. But we can only imagine what that freedom to worship meant to them. Do not forget those who do not have the privileges that we have of being able to meet openly to worship God. Secondly then, the restoration of the Passover. It seems that immediately the temple had been cleansed, cleansed and rededicated, Hezekiah sets about reordering national life in accordance with God's revealed will. The annual festival of Passover is to be celebrated. Now we're not clear precisely on the timing of all these things. Was it before the destruction of the Northern Kingdom of Israel? Certainly reading 2 Kings 18, it would seem so. Four years into Hezekiah's reign, the northern kingdom of Israel was invaded. And after three years of siege, the capital, Samaria, finally fell. The people were then largely deported. So it seems probable that it was near the start of his reign that Hezekiah sent messengers into the northern kingdom to call the people to return to the worship of God 
and to come to the Passover festival at Jerusalem. Many scorned the message and the messengers, but some traveled south and gather with the people of Judah. The festival was a month later than normal, and not all who came, particularly from the north, had purified themselves ready for the celebration. But it is interesting that those who came helped clean up the city of Jerusalem. This time they cleaned the city of all the pagan and illegal orders. Because the people were not already fully ready for their festival, Hezekiah then prays to God on their behalf so that their devotion to God would be accepted. As with baptism or the communion service, taking part in festivals was not something that the people should treat lightly. The Jewish religion emphasised external purity as a way of encouraging internal purity of devotion to God. To take part in the festivals without recognising the purity and the holiness of God would bring judgment. But although all the rituals of external purity had not been observed, the sacrifice of those who came south, leaving their homes, their farms, this did, did show their devotion to God, a commitment to God. And so God accepts Hezekiah's prayer and the worship of these Israelites. It was such a glorious celebration that the whole community decided to extend their celebration for a second week. And so Hezekiah provided a vast number of animals for the sacrifices, which would have been partly burnt on the altar and partly used to provide food for those celebrating at the feast. 2 Chronicles 30, 25 to 27, the entire assembly of Judah rejoiced along with the priests and the Levites and all who had assembled from Israel, including the foreigners who had come from Israel and also those who resided in Judah. There was, a great, there was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the days of Solomon, son of, king of David, king of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. The priests and the Levites stood to bless the people and God heard them for their prayer reached heaven, his holy dwelling place. This was truly a notable event in the nation's history. But that was not the end of things. Full of zeal for God, and his honour, the people then spread out through the rest of Judah and even into some of the southern areas of Israel and destroy all the pagan altars, the Asherah poles and the sacred stones. Even the altars supposedly built to honour God were destroyed because the people were required to only make their sacrifices at the temple in Jerusalem. This was to avoid corrupt practices creeping into the worship of God. This was no flash in the pan. In 2 Chronicles 31, we find that there was an ongoing commitment to the Lord. The regular regime of, of worship was restored and the people brought their gifts to the temple. Soon there were so many gifts and tithes coming in that they started to pile up. So Hezekiah again organises distribution and storage so that the priests and the Levites can be dedicated to their sacred duties. We need to think carefully about our giving, about the responsibility of God's people that they have to make proper provision for the maintenance of right worship and the witness of God our Saviour. Tithing is a good principle to follow. Here, the key features are the joy with which the people give and the abundance of their giving. God's goodness to his people is reflected in his generosity to them. And the people are then prompted to be generous in their giving to God. 
And so in 2 Chronicles 31, 20 and 21, we read, This is what Hezekiah did throughout Judah, doing what was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God. In everything that he undertook in the service of God's temple and in obedience to the law and the commands, he sought his God and worked wholeheartedly. And so he prospered. The third story relates to the threat of invasion. Everything was going well. The nation had renewed its devotion to God and in response, God had blessed them. The nation was prospering. But in the Northern Kingdom, the centuries of evil pagan rites were about to come to an end. God's judgment on their evil was about to appear in the form of the Assyrian army. Israel was a broken nation, yet it still takes the Assyrians three years to complete their conquest. Recognising the danger, Hezekiah sets about a programme of civil engineering to help defend his own nation. One of the great engineering feats of Hezekiah can still be seen in the tunnel he built to bring water into the city of Jerusalem. Elsewhere, he blocks up wells and streams to prevent an invading army having an easy time. He strengthens city defences by building defences walls and providing weapons ready for battle, organising the army and personally going to inspire them, uh, to inspire his people. 2 Chronicles 32, 7 and 8. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because the king of Assyria and the vast army with him, for there is greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people gained confidence from what Hezekiah, the king of Judah, said. Dependence on God is not meant to lead to inactivity. We are to act in wisdom to prepare for troubles that might come. But we are still to depend totally on God. Being a follower of God calls for commitment. In Luke 14, 25 to 34, Jesus warns of the cost of discipleship. He warns his hearers to count the cost of following him and to be prepared for suffering. For Hezekiah, his devotion to God was about to face a challenge. He needed to be ready. Like Hezekiah, Theodore Roosevelt similarly warned his people as they faced military opposition when he said, speak softly and carry a big stick. A detailed account of what happens next is given in 2 Kings 18 and 19. But in summary, what happened is this. Assyria, having conquered Israel, now invades Judah. The preparations that Hezekiah made slow down the invasion, and so Sennacherib, the Assyrian king, sent his chief officers to Jerusalem to call on them to surrender under terms of peace that will save them from a terrible siege. But the messengers mock Hezekiah, Judah, and God. They have not understood Hezekiah's reforms and the fact that they were in line with God's commands in Scripture. They think that the destruction of the village and town altars must be an offence to God. Surely the more altars, the more sacrifices, the more God will be pleased. So they actually suggest God will be displeased with Hezekiah and consequently that God will not help him. In any case, they argue, no nation, no God has been able to stand against Assyria. The Judeans are doomed. Better surrender now. Recognising the serious threat and the way God has been dishonoured, 
Hezekiah humbly presents the matter to God and seeks help from, from God through the prophet Isaiah. God replies that the Assyrians will not come against Jerusalem. Sennacherib will return home and die there. And that is what happened. God sends an angel who destroys the Assyrian army. Sennacherib returns home and his sons murder him. But it seems that this victory has a twist in the tale. The defeat of the Assyrian army and Sennacherib's retreat is seen as a victory for Hezekiah by the surrounding nations and they send him valuable gifts. 2 Chronicles 32, 22 and 23. So the Lord saved Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others. He took care of them on every side. Many brought gifts, uh, brought offerings to Jerusalem for the Lord and valuable gifts for Hezekiah, king of Judah. From then on, he was highly regarded by all the nations. But Hezekiah did not give all the honour to God. Instead, he became proud. Wealth can be a great trap. And so fourthly, Hezekiah's illness. In his pride, Hezekiah is rebuked with an illness. Isaiah is sent to warn Hezekiah that he will die. Hezekiah pleads with God to save him. He points to the way that he has sought to be faithful to God. He points to his good deeds and God is gracious to him. God sends Isaiah back to Hezekiah to say that he's heard Hezekiah's prayer and promises him another 15 years of life. He even gives Hezekiah a sign of his pledge by moving the sundial back 10 stages. Though Hezekiah was, has known the forgiveness of God, he has not fully learned the lesson Assyria was a waning power. In the east, Babylon was growing in strength and hearing of the recovery of the king who seemingly brought about the defeat of Assyria, the Babylonian king's son, Marduk Baladan, sends gifts and a message. Instead of just returning uh, greetings to Babylon, Hezekiah shows off all his wealth and his military strength to his envoys. God is not pleased. Back comes Hezekiah, this time with a message of judgment. 2 Kings 20, 16 and 18, to 18. Hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried away to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you, will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Hezekiah has shown the Babylonians that there are rich pickings available. They know also now know Judah's military strengths and weaknesses. But Hezekiah has become complacent and self-satisfied. Verse 19. The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied. For he thought, will there not be peace and security in my lifetime? He is apparently unconcerned about the implied defeat of Judah, the destruction and the enslavement that will, will result. It won't affect me. I wonder how concerned we are what will happen to the church here and across the land in the days after us. The Babylonian siege when it came 
was extremely bitter. The destruction was truly dreadful. But above all, the sin of the people would bring dishonour to the name of God. Indeed, even the return from exile never truly restored the honour of God. Israel never became a nation of stature on the world stage. So let's draw things to a conclusion. Hezekiah was undoubtedly one of the greatest kings that Judah ever had. In his day, the proper worship of God was restored. There was even a degree of restoration of good relationships between Judah and some of the people of the north, even if there was no substantial restoration of good relationships with the leadership in Samaria. This spiritual renewal would have been significant for those who came from Israel because this was their last chance to get right with God before their nation was destroyed. But that early zeal that Hezekiah had eventually waned. Pride got in the way. Self-satisfaction prevented Hezekiah from seeing the warnings about the future how we need a burning passion, not only for God in our days, but for the light of the gospel to grow brighter in the days that lie ahead, whether we live to see it or not. The blessings that we have in Christ are not just to be seen by ourselves, but they need to be seen by others. Remember the warning given by Amos to the people of Israel. Chapter 8, verses 11 to 19. The days are coming, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine throughout the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea, wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. May such things not happen in our land, in our day. And let us work seeking the Lord's blessing such that days like this will not happen here in the future. May the Lord keep each one of us diligent to the end.